If you have a younger sibling, or you have ever been around a young kid, then you know they can make a lot of ruckus. But how could you ever think of hurting them for it? Her name is Maddie. She goes, it's Maddie. What's her last name? Clifton. C-L-I-F is in Frank T-O-N. When's the last time anybody saw her? What, Mama, what time did I come home from voting? Imagine the panic, fear, and utter distress you'd feel as a parent if your child went missing. Who could have taken them? And the most haunting question, why? why? Well, in the cases we'll be discussing today, the reasons are beyond outrageous. And sadly, the perpetrators are teenagers. In a tiny suburb of Jacksonville, Florida, a 14-year-old boy killed his eight-year-old neighbor and then slept on top of her corpse for a whole week. In Broken Arrow, Oklahoma, two brothers decided to butcher their whole family. But someone would survive and tell the story of their terrible childhood. And the third story, well, that one's twisted in a myriad of ways. I'll leave it as a surprise for you guys. Warning, today we'll be discussing violence against small children. If this is triggering for you, this is your chance to turn back. Otherwise, let's, let's dive, dive in. in. Our first story begins with a missing girl, and with any missing girl comes a desperate mother. Jacksonville 911. Yes, sir. Hi. This is. Um, I uh, went out to play this this afternoon. I thought she was with, her, and now she's missing. How old is she? She's eight years old. Where was she playing at? Around the right around the house here. On November third, nineteen ninety eight, Sheila Clifton's heart sank. She'd come home around 5 p.m. that day, and all was well. But moments later, her eight-year-old daughter, Maddie, was nowhere to be found. Her name is Maddie. She goes, it's Maddie. What's her last name? Clifton, C-L-I-F is in Frank T-O-N. When's the last time anybody saw her? What, Mama, what time did I come home from voting? About 5.30? About 5. 4.30 to 5 o'clock. About 5.30 was the last time we saw her. And I was letting the kids play out here for a little while, and then she just, she disappeared. How can a kid vanish from right under your nose? She couldn't be too far away, Sheila thought, and she was right, but there's a really dark twist along the way. The last person to see Maddie was her 14-year-old neighbor, Joshua Earl Patrick Phillips, or Josh. Josh lived across the street from Maddie, and they used to play together along with Maddie's older sister, Jessie. But Maddie and Jessie weren't allowed to play with Josh anymore. Josh had developed a creepy sort of crush on 11-year-old Jessie, and he started behaving strangely around the two sisters. One time, he made an inappropriate adult joke in front of them. It wasn't even in front of them. It was directed at them. The girls knew this was weird, and there was someone else who had heard Josh's creepy joke, Larry Grisham a 45-year-old man who was a friend of both families and would often supervise their kids while they were playing if the parents were busy. So when Larry and both girls told the Cliftons about the joke, their reaction was a pretty strong one. Josh was banned from visiting their home and the girls were banned from playing with him. But things kept getting weirder. One day, the two sisters and their grandmother got back from school when they noticed their window had been smashed. Inside, their home had been vandalized with a staple gun. Objects were stapled together, bed sheets were stapled to the mattress, and random papers had been stapled to the walls. It was a really strange way to vandalize a place, and what's stranger is that nothing was stolen. It just sounded like someone's revenge, but they couldn't prove it was Josh. But less than a month later, the girl's parents found Josh inside Jesse's empty bedroom. They immediately kicked him out and urged him never to return. But that day, Josh stole a picture of Maddie's sister. He was obsessed with her, and his obsessions would only get darker. But as it goes, in so many true crime cases, troubled teens come from troubled families. Josh was born on March 17, 1984, in Allentown, Pennsylvania. He was the only child of Steve and Melissa, but he had two half-brothers from his mother's side, Daniel and Benji. But there was a big problem with Josh's family. His dad was a raging alcoholic, an illegal substance addict, and an abusive father and husband. 
He tormented Melissa and the three boys physically, mentally, and emotionally day after day. Then the worst happened. In 1997, Steve and Melissa split up and Steve held on to Josh. Melissa left with her other two sons, but Steve wouldn't let her take Josh too. He wanted to have custody of his son, but ignored the fact that the boys were extremely close. They had been each other's best friends for years. They listened to the same music, watched the same movies, and went to concerts together. Daniel would later say, I wish he had never left Pennsylvania. Our father took him away from me. He would have had me, he would have had Benji, he would have been an uncle to my kid, and he would have assimilated into my life here. Josh was now all alone with his abusive father. When Steve took him and moved to Florida, Josh felt lost. He had no friends, he didn't know the area, and he was stuck with someone he was desperate to get away from. On November 3rd, 1998, everyone was looking for Maddie. Sheila, her own mom, the police, several volunteers, and of course her neighbors. When he saw all the officers on his street, Josh rushed to Sheila and asked what had happened. When she told him Maddie was missing, he seemed distraught. She was once his friend, and he knew her sister and her quite well, so he immediately joined the search and helped officers with whatever information they requested. But no matter how far the police extended their search radius, Maddie was nowhere to be found. Desperate, Sheila and her husband offered a $50,000 reward for Maddie's return. They didn't have a lot of money but they would have given all of their life savings for their daughter. A few days into the case, it seemed like the police made a breakthrough. They had a suspect. It was 45-year-old Larry Gershom, Maddie's neighbor and the family friend who often supervised the children while they were playing outside. As per Larry himself, I'm a prime suspect. I'm 45 years old, I play with children, and I have a criminal record. That makes me a suspect. Yeah, he was pretty straightforward about it. Larry had been involved in an assault about 15 years back, and the fact that he was so close to the neighbor's children made him look at the very least creepy in the police's eyes. But Larry passed a polygraph test, and he also had a strong alibi for the afternoon Maddie disappeared. He was cleared of all charges, but the police weren't necessarily happy about it. Now, they had no idea who else could be a suspect. In fact, the search seemed to die down towards the end of the week. There were no leads, no clues, and now there was no hope. But then, someone who had never been involved in the search found Maddie. A week after Maddie's disappearance, Josh's stepmom was cleaning the house. That's when she noticed a strange spot on the carpet in front of Josh's room, not to speak about the foul smell coming from in there. So she went in. Inside Josh's bedroom was another strange sight. A part of his bed frame was broken and taped back together. When she kneeled down and investigated this, she saw Maddie's legs sticking out. She ran out of the house and grabbed onto the nearest police officer. I just pointed to where they needed to look. I couldn't even go in. Josh had squeezed Maddie's body under his waterbed. But as her feet were sticking out, he taped the bed frame so as to try and hide this. Somehow he actually managed to do so for a whole week. The police officers had even been inside the house and had smelled something horrible. But Josh had birds inside his room, so the officers simply shrugged it off as a foul bird smell. Josh's room was a mess. Clutter had taken over every piece of furniture and you could hardly even walk around the room. Still, you could clearly see a few very disturbing details. There were air fresheners everywhere. And on the nightstand, there was a flyer of Maddie. Perhaps the most horrifying sight at the crime scene was Maddie's little hand still clutching the bed frame. This means that she was still alive when Josh shoved her under his bed. How could a 14-year-old boy do this? On the afternoon of November 3rd, Josh was outside playing baseball. Maddie saw him and crossed the street to join him. He was reluctant at first. After all, he'd been banned by the Cliftons. But Maddie said her parents were out and Josh's parents were gone too. So they played together for a while and then Josh accidentally hit Maddie in the eye with the ball. Maddie was pretty upset, any eight-year-old would be. When she started crying, Josh panicked. In his mind, as soon as his father would hear about this, he would be dead. He couldn't bear the abuse anymore. So he decided to take it out on Maddie and silence her before his dad got home. He dragged her into the house 
and then hit her on the head with the baseball bat. Then he opened her throat and jabbed her around 10 times. Finally, he took off her shorts and shoved her under his waterbed. Imagine this being your solution to avoid a beating from your dad. How sick is that? On November 10th, 1993, Josh was arrested. The community was in shock. This was the shy, quiet, 14-year-old boy who had recently moved to Florida and was trying hard to make friends. Sure, he was a little weird, but no one ever suspected he was capable of taking a life, let alone sleeping on top of Maddie's body for a whole week. Josh was tried as an adult. His defense argued that Maddie's death was an accident gone terribly wrong, a result of Josh's panic and perhaps madness. But the prosecution argued otherwise. They saw it as a crime. Josh had said that Maddie's pants had come off when he dragged her into the house, but there was no dirt on her pants, and whose pants simply fall off like this. Maddie was found wearing just her shirt and socks. She hadn't been insulted, but there was an inappropriate tone to the murder. Also, Josh couldn't prove that they were playing baseball or that Maddie had been hit by the ball. There was no bruising on her face. Josh was sentenced to life in prison without the possibility of parole. What followed were several appeals where Josh tried to get a lighter sentence. After all, he was 14 when he was charged. So far, his sentence remains the same, but no matter what the final outcome, he says his sentence helped him grow faster. The fact that I had to come to terms in dealing with that I'm gonna die in here, I might do 60, 70 years in prison, really helped me mature and, and helped me grow. Uh, morally and, and, and it helped me, to help me develop empathy. Josh got his high school degree, tutored other inmates, and attended religious services. In 2008, he said he wasn't sure if he deserved a second chance, but he desperately wanted one. On the other hand, Maddie's family has barely recovered from the horrific story. It might have happened 30 years ago, but imagine losing your daughter that way. They're also upset that Josh has never written an apology to them but Josh is adamant that he should apologize in person, not via email. And I have, you know, so you can see the sincerity. They won't be able to see it in the letter, you know what I mean? Josh is still hoping for a second chance, as his sentence will be reevaluated in 2023. But Maddie's family will never get a second chance at spending time with their daughter. Our next case takes place in a small town called Broken Arrow, Oklahoma. Well, it's not really a town, it's a suburb of Tulsa, and it's a nice, peaceful place that attracts a lot of young families. Broken Arrow might be small, but this family was a big one. The father David, mother April, Robert Michael, Daniel, Christopher, Victoria, Crystal, and Autumn. Yep, they had seven kids, and they all lived in a big, beautiful house close to the Arkansas River. Robert, the oldest kid, had an obsession. He was bored with life in that little town, and with his big family being his only life. He and all his siblings were homeschooled by April, and he had no friends outside of his family. He wanted to be famous and leave his family. I'm going to make my first sketch soon. Can't show you a sneak preview or it would ruin it. It would be like a minute long. It's, it's, it's going to be some good stuff. I think it's going to be hilarious. This might look questionable, but Robert was indeed very bored. Everyone who knew the Bever family could confirm that they were a very quiet group. This was odd for a family of nine. Usually when there's seven kids, there's a whole lot of noise coming from inside the house, but this wasn't the case with the Bevers. April was a stay-at-home mom and a big lover of Reddit. She was into computer science and she wanted to get all of her kids interested in it. So she took to Reddit in asking for advice. She would also describe herself as tired, happy, blessed. David was not as grateful as his wife. He worked as a technician for HP and he was the only person earning money for the family. But that was not the problem. David was abusive to his family in every way imaginable. So the neighbors saw these quiet kids who respected their parents, but they were actually terrified of them. For Robert, his escape would be YouTube, particularly his channel, Cult Empire. Props for that. Props for props for that. Impossible. Yeah. Take him on something there. New ref. New hairstyle, check it. It's called a faux hawk, where I don't have to shave the rest of my head, but I still get uh, 
Mohawk. I hope it still looks like a faux hawk. Soon enough, Robert's brother Michael joined his passion for YouTube. It was lovely to see the two oldest brothers coming together to make funny skits and cherish their friendship online as well. But as they grew older, they discovered the darker corners of the internet. Robert's obsession for fame soon became an obsession for mass murder, and his little brother joined in on it. All day long, they would look at videos about the Columbine shooting and other school massacres. This is what Robert and Michael now associated with fame. They wanted to become school shooters and become worldwide famous, except their school was their home. In 2014, Robert got a job at a call center and started saving money, but he wouldn't use it to buy new clothes or technology. He bought machetes, knives, Kevlar vests, and black masks. Their sister, Crystal, who was 13 at the time, actually raised some concerns with her mom. She asked her if she noticed what the boys were buying and watching online. April just shrugged it off as typical teenage boy activity. Whether she really didn't know or she didn't want to believe it, but typical teenage boys aren't obsessed with becoming mass murderers. Just before midnight on July 22nd, 2015, the Broken Arrow Emergency Services received a call. Broken Arrow 911. Hello? Oh, my dog is attacking my family. It took the police several minutes to find the Bever house, and when they did, they discovered a sight that would scar them for life. First, Crystal ran into the driveway and collapsed in the officer's arms. She'd been stabbed multiple times in the chest. Barely breathing, she was taken in by the paramedics. Inside the house, April, David, and Daniel were lying in a pool of blood on the floor. Inside the bathroom were the bodies of seven-year-old Christopher and five-year-old Victoria. Two-year-old Autumn was the only one left untouched. She was crying in her crib. Crystal survived the attack and made it clear to the cops that it was her older brothers they were looking for. Within an hour, 18-year-old Robert and 16-year-old Michael were found hiding in a bush in the forest behind their house. They were immediately arrested and charged with first-degree murder. While Michael looked scared and regretful, Robert declared he was proud of what he had just done. Needless to say, everyone who heard about this massacre was shocked. Who kills their entire family? Just how bad were the Bevers? Had their family done something awful to the kids? Or were Robert and Michael simply bad seeds? Uh, a couple months ago, I think in fact, we still had scare. We started talking about uh, voodoo and rampage and stuff like that. So okay. okay. I didn't take it seriously at first, but then he started buying like body armor and stuff. So he was buying weapons because mm -hmm. you guys had talked about murdering. Yeah, and he started playing again. Okay. And then I went along with it because I didn't see the other way. I thought I didn't want to do it. I went quickly and went tonight and I didn't. Okay. That you didn't want to do it? I didn't want to do it. Still, Michael stabbed his little brother Christopher to death. The plan was even more horrific. Robert had ordered loads of guns and ammo to arrive at their home. They needed their whole family dead by July 23rd so that when the guns arrived, their parents wouldn't stand in their way. They wanted to kill their family, cut their bodies, and hide them inside bins, then take the guns and shoot a minimum of 50 people. I mean, who else were you going to kill? Just whoever you ran into? Yeah. And my we said five at a time, like gas stations and stops. Okay. And then you just keep going. That's right, this was the plan of an 18-year-old and his 16-year-old brother. It sounds absolutely crazy, but luckily only their family died that day. When Michael was asked about the boys' relationship with their parents, he gave a little insight into their dad. Yeah, I mean, mom's okay, dad was older. Just a little bit too much. Yeah, I mean, she's okay, but she's not okay. Michael might have seemed a victim of his dad or of his manipulative older brother, but what he did on the evening of July 22nd was unspeakable. First, the two boys stabbed Crystal after luring her to watch something on Robert's computer. Then, after Robert attacked his parents, Christopher and Victoria locked themselves inside the bathroom. So Michael feigned an attack. He started crying as if Robert was attacking him and begged his younger siblings to let him inside the bathroom too. When they opened the door, he killed Christopher, and Robert took Victoria's life. Well, what I'm saying is, is it's not Robert's the one that should get all the credit here. I mean, for, I mean, um, 
Yeah, well, because it's a big deal. I mean, you're going to be on the news. Um, you know what I mean? People are going to want to interview. I don't want to Michael said Robert had decided to butcher his family at the beginning of 2015. He was going to do it whether Michael was a part of it or not. In fact, if Michael didn't go along with Robert, Robert would kill him too, just like the rest of his siblings. At least that's his side of the story. But when the police interviewed Robert, the story was quite different. Robert and Michael had both been happy to make the plan and go along with it. No one forced anyone into anything. Well, uh, I was right. The guys that are interviewing Robert um, kind of gave me a quick version of what he's saying that you did. Yeah. And you had told me everything. It turns out that Michael not only killed Christopher, but he his mother's throat. On July 23rd, 3,000 rounds of ammo arrived at the Bever house. By now, the police had closed the crime scene and several reporters were talking about the gruesome attacks on the news. The youngest family member, a two-year-old girl, is in the custody of the state and not hurt. Police say the two other children, teenage boys, were the ones responsible for these killings. And the details of what took place last night are slowly starting to be painted today a gruesome picture. The brothers were charged with five counts of first-degree murder and battery. Both brothers were tried as adults. Throughout his trial, Robert seemed happy. Robert was 18 when charged, so tried as an adult. That meant penalty was on the cards. Michael was 16, but he also was tried as an adult. They both pleaded not guilty. However, in 2016, he tried to take his own life inside his prison cell. Outrageously, both brothers pleaded not guilty. Robert eventually changed his plea to guilty after the 2016 incident. He was sentenced to five consecutive life terms without the possibility of parole. Michael stood by his not guilty decision and tried to go for the insanity defense. But Michael got the same prison sentence. After all, he was the one who lured two of the Bever kids to their death. In 2019, Robert attacked two staff members at his prison. He was immediately taken down. Sadly, it doesn't seem like he's on the path to rehabilitation. Neither is Michael, who has been drawing these kinds of things in his personal diary. Also in 2019, the Bever House mysteriously burned down and a park was built in its place. When I say mysterious, I mean arson that the police were happy to let happen. The place had become a creepy visiting spot for rebellious teens and no one in the neighborhood was happy about it. What's left of the Bever family, Crystal and Autumn, have both been adopted by the same family. Hopefully they will be able to have a happy, normal life and slowly accept their terrible, tragic past. Well, our last story is a pretty different one. The camera likes you. <laughs> no, no. <laughs> Justin Woodrum was born in 1995 in Indiana, and he was unlucky from day one. His parents abandoned him, and he was raised by his grandparents who abused him. When he was only five, his grandfather violated him. And on top of everything, Justin had serious learning disabilities. Aged 14, he scored 42 on his IQ test. It's unclear whether the deep trauma from his childhood affected his learning abilities or whether he was born this way. Nevertheless, Justin was alone, scared, and lost in a world that he didn't understand and that didn't seem to understand him. One day, Justin was sitting at the dinner table with some family friends of his mother. He was sitting next to the family's two children, and he was getting upset over the lack of attention from the parents. He got upset with them because he asked for another pork chop, and they told him no, and he got angry and left the, left the dinner table and actually touched and pulled the two children. His explanation for doing that was that he knew it would make the adults mad. He was just trying to get them mad to get back for the fact that they didn't get any attention. This was a child that had been arrested several times from a very young age. He knew how terrible that was, yet he didn't know how else to communicate his anger at the two adults. 
For all his life, Justin hated the adults he grew up with. So when these two parents were mean to him, he associated them with his evil grandparents. Justin didn't seriously harm the children, but of course, what he did was very wrong, and the children's parents were beyond angry. At age 13, Justin was sent to Pendleton Juvenile Correctional Facility. Pendleton is a maximum security juvenile prison where boys aged 10 to 21 are held for some of the worst crimes imaginable, rape and murder included. Here, Justin was more lost and alone than ever. Justin is a perfect example of a, of a kid who was here for all the wrong reasons. Yet he, he absolutely did some things that were wrong. But when you look at his trauma that he's been through, and you look at his his mental health situation and things like that. You know, all prison did was make him worse. A quick look at Justin's behavior back in 2009 made it clear that prison was not the perfect place for him. You hear me? Um, Justin, please get off the door. You have an injury. Oh my. I'll bet you can't speak that language. I'll bet I could. He's learned all this. It's in there. Indeed, when Justin was sent to prison, he could barely speak English. He didn't understand very basic social interaction rules, nor could he go to the classes organized by teachers at the juvenile prison. In fact, he needed 24 7 supervision. His IQ level is around 40. 40. Mm -hmm. And he's placed in this facility based upon the needs because at this facility there is 24-hour medical care here. But Pendleton wasn't the right place for Justin. It was a place filled with violence and chaos, and it only caused Justin an aggravation of all his symptoms, extreme anxiety, fear, and paranoia. It was almost like he was having night terrors, he was seeing things, and his fear was so tangible. I mean, he was truly frightened and um, I remember his eating habits started changing. I think he started losing weight really quick, but he was having very bad nightmares. He was afraid of uh, lots of the male staff, you know, hence the history that he dealt with. Justin was now an orphan and he had no family members willing to adopt him. So he had no agency to take him under their wing or pay for his rehabilitation treatment. Desperate to help Justin be in the right place, Warden Mike Dempsey paid for Justin's treatment at DeMar's Center for Children with Disabilities. There, he would receive the proper care and education, and he wouldn't be locked up with violent offenders. Justin's story is a pretty sad one. The moment he got thrown in jail, his whole family disappeared. His mother was nowhere to be found by the officers, and no one wanted the responsibility of taking care of him. Unfortunately, this is a recurrent story in the U.S. We've hired private investigators to find families for our children, especially our older youth, that have disconnected from their families because some of them will just say, you know, I can't handle these problems. I can't deal with my own life, much less their life, and they just disappear. How is that fair to the children? Slowly but surely, Indiana saw some positive changes in laws when it comes to juvenile offenders with serious mental disabilities. Now, such kids always get a state-assigned lawyer before they go to the DOC, and Pendleton is closing its unit for mentally disabled children. This is happening everywhere. It's happening in every state. Every state that I've talked to struggles with this issue. The prisons, whether they're adult or juvenile, have become the, the mental health providers for offenders or kids with disabilities. We're going to work hard to make sure that these staff identify those kids up front and that the judge has the options and the available services to put these kids somewhere else. Justin kept moving from center to center as no one could keep him forever. Paperwork, costs, and various complications in the system led to him being passed around. While not great, Justin did have a few really supportive people around him that made sure he found a good community to teach him the ropes of being an adult. As of today, he's part of such a community and he's slowly becoming independent. What's, what's your life looking like now? Good. I, I get to do outings and stuff like that. You do? And what, what kind of stuff do you do? I go to Walmart and stuff like that. I'm in the community now. Justin's sad story seems to have a happy ending. He was born in one of the most unlucky situations ever, and he's had nothing but hardship. And when it got even worse, his family disappeared. But now he has a new family. 
Still, what about the other orphans and all the unlucky kids who are mistreated and abused from day one? Can we improve our system so that we prevent them from going to prison? Is there hope for kids like Justin? Thanks for watching, you guys. What do you think about these cases? Let me know down in the comment section. And before you go, make sure you click that like button and subscribe for more. See you next time.